Good evening, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, it's a great, great, great pleasure to have you all of here, all of you here for this important event. It's always a great opportunity for all of us to have a constructive and fruitful dialogue. Uh, I'm uh, joined by Mr. Luca De Meo, the CEO of the group, Mr. Thierry Pieton, our uh, CFO, Mrs. Kitri de Pelport, the group's chief legal officer. We're also pleased to have here on the front row the members of the board of directors, members of the executive committee, the statutory auditors, and the two shareholder representatives who will act as scrutineers. I should also like to inform you of the presence of a bailiff. I'll now give you some legal information for the holding of this AGM. I uh, remind you that the notice of this meeting was published in the Bulletin des Annonces Légales Obligatoires and in the Legal Gazette on the 31st of March 2023. Registered shareholders, holders of FCP units, and the statutory auditors were convened by post or by email. I now turn to the composition of the Bureau of this meeting. In my capacity as Chairman of the Board of Directors, it will be for me to chair the meeting. The functions of uh, scrutineers will be carried out by the French state, represented by Mr. Victor Couchois and uh, Amunde, the company, represented by Mr. Edouard Dubois, in the function of Secretary of the AGM by Mrs. Kitri de Pelport. And the Bureau is thus constituted. All legal documents have been deposited on the desk in accordance with the legal provisions and made available to the shareholders. As from the, the convening of this meeting, these documents are recognized as being in order by the Bureau. The notice of the meeting, including the agenda and the texts of the resolutions, as well as the documentation required for this meeting, have been made available on the company's website. It's been confirmed to me that since more than a quarter of the shares comprising the share capital and having the right to vote are represented today, the meeting can therefore legally deliberate on both the ordinary and extraordinary resolutions on the agenda. The secretary of the meeting will provide you with the final figures just before the vote on the resolutions. I'd like to point out that this meeting is being filmed and broadcast on the Renault Group website. In a moment, I'll give the floor to Luca de Mero, who will tell you about the transformation of our group and the steps Renault is taking to deal with the different revolutions our industry is undergoing today. But first, I'd like to share some thoughts with you. I'd like to start by highlighting the exceptional results we achieved in 2022. They're all the more exceptional because they were obtained in a context of crises that were extended, the semiconductor crisis, supply difficulties, geopolitical tensions, and even aggravated thing of inflation, the energy crisis, and, of course, this terrible war in the Ukraine. I'd like to express my gratitude to Luca Di Meo and the Renault Group's teams and congratulate them on these results and, more generally, on their achievements to have exceeded or expectations. I'd also like to thank you, dear shareholders, for your constant support over the last few years, even though some observers were skeptical about our ability to bounce back. The payment, the paying out of a dividend, even if it's still, in a, in a, it's still a modest one, it's, it's a tangible sign of our recovery, which allows us to look to the future with confidence and determination. What strikes me about the company's achievements is that they are remarkable in terms of both quantity and quality. In a few moments, Thierry Pieton will remind us of the figures that reflect the scale of our performance. At I would like to mention the qualitative aspect, which ultimately is the way, the way in which these results were achieved. In the face of so many headwinds from all directions, Renault Group has shown agility, resilience, 
and solidarity. It's been able to build on the foundation of its raison d'etre, which, as you know, is the spirit of innovation found at all levels of the company. Our corporate purpose also states that we believe in responsible progress that respects everyone and that we're fighting to ensure that mobility can be shared by everyone. Our idea is to create the conditions for a fair transition à la Renault, because, if I may say so, this is in the company's DNA. Now, this was the theme of the four sessions of our Corporate Purpose Committee, whose recommendations for a fair transition were presented to the board this very morning. All of this has made it possible for us to work in a calm environment in spite of the difficult circumstances. What better proof could there be of this than the success of the employee share ownership plan, which proves how much confidence the teams have in the company's strategy. A few, I'd like to say a few words about our governance, which I'll discuss in more detail during the AGM. All these achievements would have been impossible without the trust that exists between the board of directors and top management. And that is indeed one of the reasons why I've asked Lou Cadimio to join our board, a uh, decision that we will submit to your vote later on. And finally, of course, we must talk about the alliance. Many people doubted our ability to give it a new lease of life after this crisis years. The decisions um, announced in January last year clearly showed our willingness to accelerate the sharing of resources in terms of common platforms, electrification, batteries, or indeed electrical architecture. The agreement reached between Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi on the 6th of February uh, goes, uh, takes the same uh, logic further. It also aims to maximize value creation for all alliance uh, stakeholders from operational projects on the one hand, such as those being launched in Latin America, Indian, India, or Europe, be it pickup trucks, uh, new SUVs, or electric vehicles, or even the circular economy. On the other hand, this agreement also allows for greater agility so that partners can join new initiatives that will reinforce the company's strategic plans, including Renolution and Nation Ambition 2030. The areas of collaboration open up the possibility for Nissan or Mitsubishi to invest in Ampere, the Renault Group's electric vehicle and software entity in Europe. But they can also become customers of horse in the field of low emission uh, hybrid and uh, Com internal combustion engines, IC technology. And finally, the agreement is based on the rebalancing of cross shareholdings and strength in governance, which gives the alliance a fresh impetus and allows it, allows it to make this promising new start. A reinvigorated alliance, a rehabilitated group, these are the concrete achievements I'm pleased to share with you today. But the group has not just been turned around, it's been it's preparing for the future and has got off to a head start. And the future is set in a new environment marked by the beginning of what some are calling deglobalization, which calls into question supply chains and logistics chain, the accentuation of the economic shift towards Asia. We can clearly see the power of Asian countries in the electric mobility value chain, as well as an exacerbated tension between the major military industrial powers. All of this adds up to even more uncertainty. While we simultaneously, simultaneously have to face the environmental challenge, the demographic challenge, the urbanization challenge, as well as the technological and ethical challenges linked in particular to the way in which new technologies such as artificial intelligence are used. The question for a, a group such as ours is how to face the future by becoming even stronger, more responsive, and more agile. As you know, Renault Group has decided to evolve its organization by once again being innovative, which has enabled it to develop a new approach. In a moment, Luca will tell you about the philosophy of this evolution towards a more open group, run different ecosystems with the support of different partners, a pioneering response adapted 
to new businesses and new value chains. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, this is the uh, fifth AGM I have the, uh, the honor to chair. Four years is a short time, but that is how long it has taken for our world to change radically. What does the world of 2018, before the health, before the the COVID crisis, before the supply crisis, before the inflation of raw materials and energy, before the war in the Ukraine? What does that will have in common with the world of 2023? Four years ago, I agreed to become chairman of Renault in a uh, complicated context with this wonderful company. In 2019, the priority was to take emergency steps and avoid the implosion and bankruptcy, bankruptcy of the Renault Group and the Alliance. In 2020, we had to stay strong and rebuild the company's fundamentals through the Renolution strategic plan built by Luca and his teams. In 2021, our turnaround had already become a reality. As for the year 2022, it is both a culmination, the confirmation of our bounce back, and a new beginning towards the new automotive generation and towards a more concrete and offensive alliance. During these four years, the pillars of the group have been patiently built up. The strategy built, focused on product and brand value, strengthening the Make in France, Made in France axis, a 360-degree view of innovation, a CSR policy that combines social, environmental, and economic performance. The establishment of agile ecosystems, preparing the skills of tomorrow, and the definition of a new organization. So, all the decisions we make are based on these pillars. And among the many illustrations, some achievements are particularly symbolic. A little over a year ago, we uh, officialized our agreement with Vario to develop and produce a new generation of electric motors in France without using rare earths. And last April, we announced that our partner, Vercore, would reserve most of the electric batteries produced in its upcoming Dunkirk plant for Renault Group. These decisions clearly illustrate the idea of creating value in France within the framework of our electricity ecosystem system which brings together a large number of partners, both industry leaders and startups, in conjunction with regional players and territories, which makes it possible to bring together all the conditions needed to be at the forefront of environmental challenges and sustainable mobility. On 15 December, the Board of Directors proposed the renew renewal of my mandate. You will vote on this proposal later on. If you do approve it, I will continue to work to ensure that the group completes its formidable recovery within the framework of a reconfigured alliance. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention, and I will now hand over to Luca De Meo. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, a welcome when you know that when you have come safely out of the storm and things are going better, it's certainly time to say thank you to those, as I said to Jean-Dominique, to those who did not desert the ship. So today I really think it is time for all of us to say thank you, for me and for the whole of the management team of Renault to say thank you. Thank you for your confidence and thank you for standing by the Renault Group during these very difficult months and years. Since uh, we last met a year ago, I must uh, say the landscape has changed a lot. I think we have finished for good with a very dark chapter in our history, perhaps one of the deepest crises the group has ever known. Remember that we were losing tens of millions of euros every week in 2020, a loss of 8 billion for the whole year. You may remember that the Renolution plan included three phases, resurrection, renovation and revolution. Today, 
There is no longer any doubt about it. This plan is working. The record results that we announced a few weeks ago confirmed that the first phase, resurrection, has been duly completed. With a profitability of 5.6%, the group achieved one of its best profitability figures over the last 20 years. In just two years, we have generated more than 2 billion euros in cash, and that is more than we were able to do in the 10 previous years. And as you know, we managed to do this in an environment, as, you, as Jean Dominique was telling you, that was worse than anything that we had seen in several decades. Decades. I'm thinking, first of all, of the of the inflationary context, which came with a very hefty bill for the group, an impact of three billion euros. There have also been many difficulties with the worldwide supply chains, and then, of course, there was a crisis in Russia, where the group was very much exposed. And many people said that this would be the final blow for Renault. But actually, in just six months, we were able to more than compensate for that shock. This is a clear sign that our ship now has the capacity to move forward even in stormy weather. And this is the result of a truly admirable mobilization of the win, women and the men of the Renault Group. And I would like to say once again how very proud I am to have been with them in this adventure for now a little over two and a half years. The result of all of these efforts is that we have been able to take the company to another level entirely in terms of performance. Excluding fixed costs, we recorded the highest margin per vehicle in 10 years in 2022. Compared to 2020, it was a 40 percent increase on our margin. We also pushed the utilization rate of our factories to almost 100 percent in H1 of 2023. And of course, we had, uh, because we were able to reduce our capacity by 1.2 million units uh, from 2019 onwards. Finally, we were able, even able to, uh, to reduce our break-even point by half, and this is something that Renault had never done before. I want to make this extremely clear, all of this discipline that we have demonstrated is something that we will continue to show and we are aiming even higher. The second phase of the Renolution plan, renovation, concerns our products. And that phase two is well underway, I can assure you. What has happened, actually, is that we have put the product back at the heart of the company. We worked very hard, all of us together, on quality, and we raised it to a level that had never been measured in this company before. Above all, we have prepared what is going to be the best lineup that the group has had for 30 years. We have 18 launches coming in just uh, three years, from 2023 to 2025. This, I do believe, is going to give us a huge boost because we managed to turn the group around while we were in a rather weak product cycle. With the Megan Electric, with Austro, we have already given the world a first glimpse, but that was just the beginning. Just the starter, if you will. And the main course is about to arrive. You've probably already heard what we're planning with the Renault 4, the Renault 5, the Scenic, because we have already talked about them to the media. But I can tell you that there are many other very pleasant surprises awaiting you over the months to come. Recently, we revealed three of these surprises. First of all, the new jogger. This is a very important step that Dacia is taking towards affordable electrification for everyone. And I'd like to especially thank the Dacia teams who are really doing a remarkable job and have been for the last few years. We also revealed the new Espace. It's a voiture à vivre or a lifestyle car 
car, updated with today's technology with hybrid efficiency and connectivity. And most recently, we unveiled new Clio. And this new Clio is simply going to continue a huge love affair with a car that has already sold over 16 million units. So we have got Renault back on track. Of course, I do also include the fresh impetus that we have given to the Alliance and which Jean-Dominique has told you about. Today, we are doing more than just closing a chapter. We are also opening up a whole new chapter. And the game changer is what we announced in November. We are pushing to make Renault into a next-generation car company. The idea is quite a simple one. For 125 years, car makers have only had to be good at one spot, based around the value chain of ICE cars. And today, new value chains are growing out of this one, a bit like branches on the trunk of a tree. Electric, software, new mobilities, the circular economy. All of these actually represent new and completely different sports. The most logical thing to do, therefore, is to ensure that we have specialized teams for each sport, rather than asking everyone to do a little bit of everything. There is also a second principle at the heart of our revolution, which is the choice of an approach that is horizontal and ecosystemic. In mature technologies and stable markets, scale and efficiency are the mantra, and this is something that I have been hearing for the last 30 years. But what happens when technology evolves extremely fast and demand becomes volatile, as is the case today? Then you have to focus the whole system on agility and the capacity to innovate so that you can seize opportunities and sh take the sharp hairpin bends without veering off the road. The horizontal approach is also precisely to partner with the best, with those who have a chance of finding the right technology. We are not going to delegate innovation. No way. Nor are we, on the other hand, going to think that we can do everything by ourselves. What we are doing, actually, is to co-develop co-create. This allows us to de-risk, to share investments, and to expose our teams to the most innovative organizations throughout the value chain and throughout all value chains. That is what a next-generation car company looks like. It is a company whose business model is focused on high-growth, high-profitability segments. And it's also a company that is less dependent on the traditional automotive value chain. That is why that's why we have created four compact and agile teams dedicated to the new sports of mobility. They are Ampere, Alpine, Mobilize, and the future is neutral. And of course, we've not forgotten our traditional business, which is represented by Horse, which is going to be a leader in, in internal combustion engines, and also by Power. Thanks to the increase in its product range, Power, which is our traditional activity, will ensure very positive and increasing results in the coming years. Another thing that must also be made very clear alongside this logic of specialization, the group must remain one single group. The corporate structure, which will be made lighter and simpler, still has its mission of strategic orientation, of support, and also of business coordination. So the next-gen automotive company is also an open company. The network of partnerships, we've quoted a couple of them, that we have set, built up with our horizontal approach across value chains is actually a rather unique network. We are talking about more than 20 partnerships here, signed since 2020 and we're not going to stop there, I can assure you. The group now works closely with the very best in all sectors. The aim of all of this is to put Renault back in a position where we can aspire to the leadership in many sectors. So far, we have been forced to play the game of resilience. We had to ensure our survival. From now on, we're going to be aiming at the top.
We are choosing to be bold and innovative because the very fast-paced changes in our industry, we believe, represent a unique opportunity for us. Any company that succeeds in negotiating these bends well will have the opportunity to take the lead in this industry. And for the past six months, I can assure you, we've been moving forward very quickly. First of all, HORSE is taking shape. Its management team was appointed just a few weeks ago. It was also announced that Aramco, after GD, was taking part in this adventure. And this adds even more credibility to the whole story. The necessary legal entities have been created in each of the seven countries where hosts will be present, and we will be ready to start operations within the next few months. What about Ampere, our electric vehicle and software champion? Well, there again, the project management team has been appointed. We're also exploring the possibility of involving other strategic investors in addition to Qualcomm. We are considering the possibility of opening up the company's capital, and we will be holding a capital market day over the next few months. For Mobilize now, we are moving towards strengthening our activities in the world of leasing. And we also want to extend our coverage of the value chain by developing service offers around energy. Then we have the future is neutral. Here, our ambition is to cover the entire value chain of the circular economy. We are already generating a turnover of 840 million euros through Indra, Gaia, and Boon Komenor. And the next step is to invest in battery recycling. We already have a partnership in the pipeline and discussions with stra strategic investors on opening up the capital are today moving in the right direction. Finally, the Alpine project is also progressing very quickly. We are, uh, and in terms of the product, the new range, uh, the new lineup is uh, very much in development. After the A110R and the re reveal of the A290 Beta two days ago, Alpine will be unveiling two new models over the next two years. The goal is to have six models and a 100% electric lineup by 2027. And to enter the U.S. market, and perhaps even China, two vehicles are being prepared in the larger car segments. By the end of the year, we should be able to announce new partnerships to further, further boost Alpine's international expansion. And we are also reviewing potential investors today. Now, at the group level, we are at the corporate structure level, we are also creating a digital twin of the entire company. We're actually the first company to do this. In concrete terms, what we are doing is we are developing through strategic partnerships six digital platforms, and they will enable us to manage the company's major processes. For example, with DASO Systems, we are completely digitizing product development using the 3D experience platform. This will represent 200 million euros of savings per year from 2026 onwards. The same thing is being done for the finance department with SAP for HANA, with an expected productivity saving of 200 million euros per year. And we are also setting this up for our after-sales service with Techion and for industry and end-to-end -end logistics with Google. Our partnership with Google will contribute to a 30 percent reduction in energy consumption that we are aiming at in our factories by 2025. And all of these six platforms will be connected to each other. The aim is to break down silos, to harmonize data so that it flows very smoothly throughout the group, and to increase the speed of decision making, improve our productivity and simplicity as well. At the forefront of this very advanced digitization of the company, there are also incredible prospects for the application of AI to increase the group's capacity for anticipation and its adaptation tenfold in an environment that is changing faster than ever.
Finally, we are today in the process of making Renault the most committed manufacturer to ensure that future mobility is driven by fair innovation, which forgets neither the environment nor our customers nor our employees. Last year, we were ranked second in the automotive industry uh, by the Vigio Aris Moody's rating agency. In terms of decarbonization, I am particularly proud to tell you today that the Renault Group has achieved something that no one else in our sector has managed. We reduced the group's overall footprint by 25 percent between 2010 and 2022. This is the result of more than a decade of investment and very hard work. And it puts us on track, I believe, to achieve carbon neutrality in Europe by 2040 and worldwide by 2050. The group's transformation is accelerating this movement because it is creating life, life cycle decarbonization champions. For example, with the future is neutral, which helps us to accelerate the percentage of recycled materials used in our vehicles. For example, also with Ampere, which will have a carbon neutral industry by 2025. Or, for example, with Mobilize, which is there to innovate on the use of batteries in, its, in their second life cycle. As far as inclusion is concerned, Reno University is developing a skills transformation program for the new mobility value chain uh, professions that is quite unique in Europe. And we are extending this program beyond the group. We are talking here about 20,000 people, including 15,000 Renault Group employees who will be trained between 2021 and 2025 on subjects such as cybersecurity, software, vehicle electrification, the circular economy, etc. Finally, the third pillar of our ESG strategy is safety. Detect, guide, act, rescue. These are the key words. The Megan ETEC is spearheading this effort with its intelligent adaptive cruise control, with its battery safety system, uh, especially built for electric vehicles, and lastly, with the rescue code developed in partnership with the fire brigades of 17 countries. And Austral goes one step further with predictive eco -drive, with a, pre a predictive eco-driving assistant, while the future scenic will feature our safety score. And now I would like to, us to show you this video on Renault's climate plan, which is at the heart of our ESG strategy. Renault Group is committed to an ambitious climate transition plan to build the next generation automotive company. Our ambition is to achieve carbon neutrality in Europe in 2040 and by 2050 worldwide. Our goal is to provide everyone with more sustainable, safe and accessible forms of mobility. Our plan is crystal clear. We will transform our industry while minimizing our impact on the climate and natural resources. We act at every stage of a car's life cycle from cradle to cradle because our cars must become the very first uh, 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 very first resource of our cars because and all of this starts as soon as we design our cars it's going to help us to ensure that our whole supply chain can commit to better traceability with all of our partners that make it possible for us to accelerate so that everything can be more high performance low carbon by uh, in very quickly and with a logistics chain that is more efficient and that is linked to the transport of parts. A plan that is going to also apply to our manufacturing processes, especially thanks to our plants that will be uh, carbon neutral in Europe. A plan that has been ensured to uh, has that's been thought up to ensure that in Europe all of our cars will be 100% uh, neutral, and uh, we are doing all we can to ensure that we can become the European leader for hydrogen mobility and of its ecosystem. But we are thinking of a more durable mobility, sustainable mobility. Also means in 
in uh, increasing the life cycle of our cars and thinking of the retrofit and uh, onboard technologies. Lastly, we are strengthening our leadership in, uh, to ensure that we can ensure that recycling is done from car to car. So this is quite clear now. Renault Group is part uh, for at Renault Group. The climate is an integral part of our plan to create sustainable value and to ensure fair innovation that serves everyone. So now it's time to execute the transformation of the group. I think this is a colossal challenge, but Renault teams are driven by a confidence and a desire that can only be found in those who have had to overcome an existential crisis. And most importantly, setting up a new car business model is a challenge that actually only comes around once in a generation. And I must tell you that what really gives me the greatest pleasure at a daily level is to feel the pride that the people of Renault have regained in their company. Also, this is also true because they see that the way people see Renault has changed. And in fact, 40,000 of them bought Renault shares through the employee share ownership plan that we launched in November. And we can also see in all the surveys that we carry out that confidence in management has risen by almost 30 percent since 2020. This is a sure sign that something has changed. Renault has started to believe in Renault again. And with that belief, I do believe we can go very far indeed. Later on, ladies and gentlemen, shareholders, you will be asked to appoint me to the board of directors to give me your trust. But I would like now to thank you again for the confidence that you have shown in us over all these months. And today, the fact that we can pay out a dividend again is the result of all the work that we have done together. And we are quite determined that it will not stop there. And now I would like to give the floor to Thierry Pieton, our CFO. Thank you, Luca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today to comment on the financial results for the year 2022 before discussing sales trends and uh, first developments uh, of 2023. As Jean-Dominique and Luca pointed out, 2022 was a challenging year for the automotive sector as a whole, which was impacted by inflation, the continuing semiconductor crisis, and indeed challenges on the supply chains. For uh, Renault Group in particular, we also had to implement the disposal, the sale of our Russian operations within a very short time frame. In this context, the group has been extremely resilient and has achieved levels of profitability and cash generation that exceeded our financial outlook and indeed exceeded market expectation. I will develop, I will elaborate on these aspects in a few moments. But before co commenting on the financial performance, I'd like to remind you that the disposal of our Russian operations has significantly, significantly impacted our financial financial statements in 2022. I will not comment in detail on the figures presented on the screen, but I think it's important to recall that the net result of discontinued operations resulted in a non-cash loss of 2.3 billion euros, which was recognized at the end of the first half of 2022. And so to allow for a like for life like comparison, the 2021 figures you will see in this presentation have been restated to present a comparable basis excluding Russia. 
As you'll see in the rest of this presentation, our performance in 2022, in 2022 was more, more than compensated for the impact of Russia. Few observers would have bet on this assumption only a few months ago. In 2022, Renault Group sold 2.1 million vehicles, down 5.9 percent from 2021. However, it's important to note that group sales in the C segment uh, rose 23 percent over the period in Europe to more than 420,000 units. This amounted to 39% of sales by the end of 2022, confirming the success of, the success of our offensive in this profitable segment for both Renault and Dacia. The Renault brand, more exposed to the semiconductor shortage, sold uh, 1.4 million vehicles in 2022, down 9.4%. However, the brand has made significant progress in Europe in high value added segments, electrified vehicles, private sales, and the C segment, thanks in particular to the success of Megan E-Tech and Arcana. Dacia is one of the few consumer car brands that experienced growth in Europe in 2022, with more than 570,000 vehicles sold up nearly 7 percent over the period. This result, this performance once again, proves the success of the brand's positioning with a unique price performance ratio in the market. Dacia has be benefited from the launch of four new models in 16 months, Santero, Spring and Dust in 2021 and Jogger in 2022 each of which contributed to the brand's growth in 2022. Alpine achieved a new sales record with more than 3,500 vehicles sold up 33 percent compared to 2021. The brand was driven in particular by the success of limited editions of the iconic Alpine one, A110. Finally, our backlog at the end of 2022 has reached record levels at 3.5 months. Group revenues increased by 11.4% in 2022 compared to 2021, reaching 46.4 billion euro at constant exchange rates. This increased by 12.4%, more than offsetting the impact of the sale of our Russian activities. Automotive sales rose by 11.4% to 43.1 billion euros in 2022. It mainly benefited first from a price effect of nearly 10 percentage points directly linked to the continuation of our commercial policy focused on value rather than volumes, price increases to offset cost inflation and the optimization of commercial discounts. And secondly, a mix effect of around three percentage points linked to the offensive of the Renault and Dacia brands in the C segment. Mobility services contributed to 35 million euros uh, for the full year 2022, up from 24 million the previous year. And our financial captive uh, bank mobilized financial services generated 3.2 billion euros in revenue, up more than 10 percent. This was primarily due to higher interest rates and an increase in the average amount financed per vehicle. I'd like to turn now to the group's operating margin. This has more than doubled in 2022, amounting to 2.6 billion euros, or 5.6 percent of revenue up 2.8 percentage points compared to 2021. The margin reached 4.7 percent in the first half of the year and improved further in the second half, reaching 6.4 percent. As already mentioned, the commercial policy implemented and the product uh, offensive enabled the price mix enrichment effects and productivity to more than offset the rise in raw materials and costs as a whole. The operating margin for the automotive business was positive at 1.4 billion euros or 3.3 percent of automotive revenue. Our uh, financing business, mobilized financial services, contributed 1.2 billion euros to the group's operating margin, the highest margin in absolute terms ever achieved. This further demonstrates the value of this business to the group. The chart tracking operating margin speaks for itself and demonstrates once again the benefits of our transformation, of our transformation plan on the group's profitability. 
the levels presented are still lower than those of our, some of our competitors, but this is only the beginning and we'll continue on this path to achieve our ambitions. And I'll continue with the income statement. Other operating income and expenses amount to minus 0.4 billion euros compared to minus 0.3 billion euros a year earlier. Asset impairments and restructuring costs were stable compared to 2021. They were partially offset by asset disposals to the tune of 202 million euros, which, as last year, mainly concern the sale of group sales subsidiaries, some of our Renault retail group branches, and uh, real estate. We had a charge of 480 million euros, essentially due to uh, in hyperinflation in Argentina. Uh, minus 295 million in 2021. Associates whose group results came to 423 million euros in 2022, slightly less than 2021. Nissan contributed 526 million euros compared to 380 million. Other associates negative to 100. 3 million euros compared to the positive impact of 135 million euros in 21. This is mainly due to the impairment of Renault Nissan Bank's shares in Russia. Taxes represented an expense of 533 million euros compared with 575 million euros in 2021. The increase in taxes due to higher pre-tax income was more than upset by the year-on-year -year change in exceptional items. Finally, the group's net income from continuing operations to that 1.6 billion euros, almost three times the level achieved for the whole of 2021. And as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, net income from dis discontinued operations amounted to minus 2.3 billion euros. In 2022, the group generated a record level of operating free cash flow from 2.1 billion euros compared with 1.3 billion in 2021. This achieved is mainly due to the significant improvement in the automotive margin, the dividend paid by mobilized financial services, and the asset disposals completed during the year. This is the highest level recorded in the last 17 years. This performance is all the more remarkable since it was achieved with only 2.1 million vehicles sold during the year. The significant improvement in our level of uh, operating free cash flow uh, also enabled us to return to a positive net financial position for the automotive segment. It reached 549 million euros, an improvement of 1.6 billion euros. As a CFO, I can assure you that it is an important milestone milestone for the group. I'd like to comment on the automotive liquidity reserves. They remained at a very comfortable level in 2022 at 17.7 billion euros. We carried out two bond issues on the Japanese, Japanese markets in very competitive terms. In particular, we carried out the group's first ever issue to retail investors for 1.4 billion euros the second largest issue ever carried out on this market by a non-financial institution. A word about loans guaranteed by the French government. Uh, one billion uh, in the first half of 2022, in addition to the repayment, the annual repayment in the second half, was paid out by Renault. At, as of the date of this meeting, the balance of loans guaranteed by the French state to be repaired by the group amounts to only 330 million euros, which will be repaid before the end of this year. In November last, we announced our intention to reinstate the payment of a dividend in 2023. We will therefore submit today for your approval the payment of a dividend of 25 cents per share for fiscal year 2022. Our policy is clear. We want to gradually increase the dividend with the medium term objective of reaching a payout ratio of 35 percent of net income group share once we've achieved our priority of returning to an investment grade rating. Let's move on to 2023 and discuss the group's sales performance in the first quarter. The group registered 535,000 vehicles in the first quarter of 2023 
an increase of more than 14% compared with the first quarter of 2022, restated for Renault Russia and Aftervars volumes. In Europe in particular, sales rose by more than 27% in a market that grew by 16%. The Renault brand sold 335,000 vehicles, up 89%, while Dacia recorded exceptional sales growth of more than 34 percent with 172,000 vehicles sold. Group revenues rose by almost 30 percent in the first quarter of 2023 to 11.5 billion euros. At constant exchange rates, they were up 32.5 percent. These figures illustrate our continued focus on value pricing and channel discipline. Naturally, this approach is increasingly supported by the success of our new models, which Luca mentioned. The group's order backlog remains at record levels in absolute terms. It amounted to 3.3 months of sale at the end of March. To conclude this presentation, I'd like to share with you our financial outlook. We are maintaining our assumptions of moderate growth for the European market and stability for our markets outside Europe. We confirm our financial outlook for 2023 with operating group operating margin uh, upwards of 6% and free cash flow from operations for the automotive segment of 2 billion euros or more. First quarter results uh, reinforce our confidence and determination to achieve our financial objectives for the year but also uh, in the medium term. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Louis Valliat from Mazars to present a summary of the reports of statutory auditors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good afternoon, rather, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Statutory Auditors, I will present to you a summary of the reports prepared for your attention. These reports have been made available to you and are included in full in the uh, notice of meeting for this general meeting. For fiscal year 2022, we issued five reports that cover the annual accounts, consolidated financial statements, remuneration of equity securities, related party agreements, and finally one report on a transaction relating to the share capital. In our first report, we certify without reservation the financial statements for the year ended 31 December 2022. In addition, in keeping with regulation, we uh, produced in our opinion report, uh, we elaborated on the key points uh, of our audit of the annual and consolidated financial statements of Renault. For the annual accounts, this is uh, the um, valuation of redeemable shares. We have uh, also issued an unqualified opinion on the 2022 financial consolidated financial statements of Renault Group. The key points of the audit brought to your attention in relation to these consolidated financial, financial statements are four number. First one, the recoverable amount of assets in the uh, automotive sector. The second concerns the method of accounting and the recoverable amount of Renault's investment in Nissan. The third concerns the calculation of expected losses on sales financing receivables. And finally, the last one concerns the uh, treatment as uh, discontinued operations of the Renault Group's disposals in the Russian Federation. For each of these items, we reviewed the accounting methods, uh, the, the accounting methods applied and satisfy, satisfied ourselves as to the reasonableness of the estimates made by Renault. For the ordinary general meetings, we uh, issued two additional reports. The first report uh, 
relates to rede redeemable shares, we, in this report, we certified that the um, elements used to calculate the variable remuneration of these uh, securities are in line with the issue contract. We also certify the figures taken from the group's consolidated financial statements. The second report relates to related party agreements. This describes the main terms and conditions of uh, the agreements of which we have been informed between your company and its comp corporate offices or between the company and companies with common directors. We have not been advised of any agreements authorized by your board of directors during the past year which would need to be submitted for your approval at this general meeting. The uh, agreements already approved by uh, uh, AGM and whose execution continued uh, during the year 2022 are recalled in our report. And finally, in connection with the extraordinary part of your general meeting, we have issued a special report concerning a uh, resolution that may affect your share capital. This uh, transaction is in, in accordance with the conditions set out in the French Commercial Code. Our report does not include any particular remark or observation to bring to your attention. Mr. Chairman, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Valard, pour cette présentation concise, mais néanmoins précise. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers actionnaires, Thank you for this detailed uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know that in this, these matters, governance is key, and this is indeed uh, the base on which we can work in trust and confidence. Without that, nothing sound can be built. Without uh, trust, you manage things on a day-to-day -day basis. Without trust or confidence, no sustainable performance can happen. And this uh, form of confidence has been with us uh, all of last year and has been indeed for the past four years. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank members of the board. I would like to thank them for their faultless commitment and their constructive positive approach, but I should also like to highlight the trust between the board of directors and top management each, uh, of course, in its own role, but with the same common objective, which is the success of Renault Group. We work hand in hand in full transparency and simplicity. And that enabled us to move a lot faster than some observers might have imagined. I would also like uh, to uh, pay tribute to the presence of Luca De Meo, who was a, has been a permanent guest at our board meetings. Luca has been a very, very val valuable support to the board, and that is why I asked him to join it. I'm now going to hand over to Mr. Pierre Fleuriot, who, as our lead director, provides the board and myself with invaluable assistance and who, as chairman of the Governance and Compensation Committee, will now present to you the results of the work of the board of directors and the compensation policies for corporate officers. I'm going to give the floor now to Pierre. Ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, shareholders, it is my pleasure in uh, my capacity as chairman of this committee to present you a summary of the activities of the board and compensation paid to corporate officers. And I'll say a few words also about the employee share ownership plan. Let's start off with the work of the board of directors. A few words come to mind. Uh, intensity and um, steadiness. Intensity because there were as many as 12 meetings compared with nine last year, 17 meetings of the various committees, 
There was a strong attendance since we have uh, an attendance rate of upwards of 95 percent at meetings of the board and committees combined. Uh, to uh, highlight some of the main themes addressed, just to give you an idea of the intensity of the work. The first theme was the disposal of activities of operations in Russia. For, uh, the board of directors met as early as 24 February 2022 um, with a view to assess the consequences for our employees uh, and indeed for operations due to the situation in the Ukraine. During that period and in the weeks that followed, there were uh, meetings with the uh, top management that enabled us to monitor the situation and indeed negotiations which led on 11 May 2022 with the approval of the Board of Directors of our uh, withdrawal from operations in Russia. There was a second example and that is the alliance, the Board of Directors uh, throughout uh, the year 2022 and right up to the announcement of the agreement signed on 6 February 2023 uh, reported on uh, talks with Nissan and Mitsubishi to uh, lay the new foundations of, uh, for the alliance. These talks uh, also led to joint meetings between members of the Renault board uh, uh, the, the Nissan board and the Mitsubishi board first in uh, January 2022 in a uh, video conference meeting, but also uh, in October in an actual meeting in presence in Japan with the whole uh, board of Renault uh, traveling to Japan. Second example, this uh, strategic seminar, this uh, principle was uh, uh, officialized, as it were, to uh, support all uh, strategic development. S uh, this seminar then also includes uh, uh, side visits, and so we went to Douai to visit the electric plant, and that, of course, is a, f a key aspect of electricity. We went to the Techno Center not just to admire the new models on the stage, but also those that uh, you haven't seen yet, but that you will see someday. Uh, and so these uh, strategic seminars also had these uh, side visits with uh, emphasis on our ESG strategy and the review of recurring issues, governance, uh, compensation, and the group's financial position. So needless to say, uh, we have come uh, a long way with the uh, Renault board, and that is uh, quite remarkable indeed. Now, membership of the board of directors, who uh, sits on the board, there are two renewals, uh, one new uh, entry and one exit. Two renewals, Jean-Dominique Senard, and that's resolution number six, uh, for you to vote on, and so the governance committee and the Renault board uh, strongly support the uh, renewal of Jean-Dominique Senard's uh, mandate, uh, which uh, if uh, you do uh, renew the mandate, uh, means that uh, he will be reappointed as chairman of the board. And in Vinclé, who, is, uh, uh, who chairs the Committee on, on Strategy and Sustainable Development, her renewable, uh, her renewal is up for, uh, is for you to vote on in the seventh resolution. Uh, and there again, the Governance Committee and the board also strongly support that. A new, <laughs> well, not exactly a, a, a new person, but uh, as a director, uh, this is a new position for Luca Di Meo. And there again, the uh, board and the and the uh, committee strongly support that. And then one departure, um, uh, Frédéric Mazella, because of his uh, uh, many other commitments, um, will be uh, leaving us. Well, leaving us, he remains close to us. And uh, uh, well, the successful launch of his new uh, entrepreneurial uh, ventures uh, uh, that, that has, is the reason why he is uh, stepping down, but we would very much like to thank him for his, his very uh, valuable help uh, and support he has extended uh, to the group. So, uh, well, that's uh, once you've uh, voted on these 6th, 7th, and 8th uh, resolutions. Uh, you can see on the next slide the uh, new composition of the 
uh, border uh, uh, after this uh, AGM. The number of uh, directors has not changed. There's a slight change in membership. You have 16 directors, four employee representatives, two uh, representatives of the French uh, government, two representatives of Nissan, six independent directors, one independent uh, chairman of the board, and Luca Di Meno in his capacity as CEO. In percentage, we have a uh, rate of in, a ratio of independent directors of 58.3 percent and about 42 percent of women. So uh, that is a snapshot, as it were, of the uh, new board as uh, submitted to your vote. That was, will take us to uh, the second part of this presentation, uh, looking at uh, the compensation packages for uh, executive officers, starting off with uh, the uh, chairman of the board for his uh, for 2022, 450,000 euros in fixed compensation without any additional uh, form of payment, any variable, any bonus or of any kind. Uh, for 2023, uh, well, not much change, you can see the slide. We're still at 450,000 uh, without any additional financial benefit uh, of any kind and so these this uh, these are resolutions 10 and 12 uh, that the governance and compensations committee as well as the board uh, these are um, proposals that we support and for which we request your vote the next issue and that is the compensation package for the uh, chief executive officer for the year 2022. Um, so you still have the same standard items, 1.3 million in fixed compensation, the variable part of the compensation package capped at 150% of the fixed compensation. So uh, that's 1.950 million provided that all the uh, performance criteria have been met and you will see in a moment that this was the case for the year this, uh, of course, bonus uh, can is. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm talking talking about performance shares. Yes. Um, so the variable uh, 1.9. Uh, then you have 75,000 performance shares, and they uh, will be uh, granted after your approval, uh, and they are subject to a, a three-year performance. And then the uh, co-investment plan, which was introduced last year, makes it possible for the uh, chief executive officer to, uh, to invest uh, in these shares to the tune of 80% uh, of the uh, well, variable part of the bonus. Uh, our uh, chief executive officer invested 298,000 euros uh, to acquire upwards of 8,000 shares. And uh, should the right conditions be met, the value of that co-investment is multiplied by two. And so uh, this is, uh, well, these are the conditions for the uh, financial package, for the compensation package for Luca Di Meo, as was decided and voted on last year. On the next page, you have the performance criteria that were defined uh, for the variable part of uh, Luca Di Meo's uh, compensation for 2022, combining uh, both qualitative and and quantitative criteria. The quantitative criteria amount to 90% and qualitative uh, criteria for 60% because the total is 150% of the uh, fixed compensation compared to the fixed uh, uh, the fixed uh, uh, compensation, and you can see the figures are there, and uh, the board was able to note uh, that all the objectives were met. On the next slide, you have the uh, Luca Di Meo's uh, compensation package for the year 2023. Well, uh, the features are uh, the same uh, uh, with one addition. So the features, you have 1.3 million in fixed compensation, variable 150 percent of 1.3 so 1.95 million, but that's subject to performance conditions. 
uh, performance shares, uh, 75,000, and a co-investment plan uh, capped at 25% uh, of the uh, fixed and variable uh, compensation package. The additional thing is uh, an additional 30% uh, in performance shares. So the way it works, well, this is subject to, of course, the actual implementation of the transformation plan in the year 2023, and that uh, will be uh, assessed at the end of this year, and this additional 30% um, either will be paid out in Renault shares, and so there would be 22,500 uh, Renault shares added to the 75,000 uh, performance shares in the traditional uh, plan, or should the uh, Ampere uh, IPO occur before the end of the year, then uh, Mr. Luca Di Meo may, assuming the uh, strategy has been properly impl implemented in 23, then Mr. Luca Di Meo would receive Ampere shares the same value of the uh, Renault shares. The uh, criteria for these, uh, are, the, uh, the criteria are over three years. So the criteria are the same. Uh, well, if it's Renault shares, it will be the same as the 75,000 Renault shares. If it is Ampere shares, uh, substituted for the 22,500 Renault shares, so that would be the Ampere uh, performance criteria, uh, net income, cash flow, and total shareholder return. Uh, but uh, that will be, of course, assessed at the end of the year. Uh, now, so 2023 is basically identical to 2022 with this additional 30%. Uh, it's, by the way, not just Luca Di Meo who gets this. This uh, will uh, apply to all um, executives in Ampere and Renault uh, involved in the uh, transformation of the strategic plan. We uh, shall now continue. You can see now the uh, criteria for the variable part. Uh, well, the same, same criteria apply, and I see no changes here. So it's the same criteria as last year. Uh, the, the weighting is 90% uh, for the financial criteria and 60% for uh, sustainable development. And you can see that uh, sustainable development itself is 40%. Uh, strategy is 10%. And uh, uh, customer satisfaction is 10%. And on the next slide, you have the other performance criteria uh, that apply to the uh, performance share plan and co investment. And that, there is only one change. And this is criteria number two, which is the net financial position for the automotive sector. It used to be net cash flow. In, uh, investors do not like us to use the same criteria for two performance indicators. So instead of free cash flow, you you use net financial position, but uh, that comes more or less to the same. In any case, you, f you have this criteria with the weighting on the right-hand side. No surprises there. And that takes us to the next page. And here we are. And there, uh, there are no surprises there, because that's exactly the same uh, indications as last year and as the previous year, well, ever since uh, Luca joined us, the uh, uh, departures, the compensation, non-compete uh, uh, clause, etc. So no changes. And that takes us to the next issue, and that is the uh, compensation of members of the board. Uh, that uh, has not changed compared to last year. There's a fixed part as member of the board and member uh, of uh, members of the committees. There's a variable part, which is attendance, uh, and uh, this sticks to a theoretical maximum amount, assuming 100% attendance, as you have on, on column number three. Uh, there is a fixed amount for chairing a committee, and there's an additional uh, additional bonus for the lead uh, director. All the items uh, were paid out uh, in 22 in 2022 to the tune of 1 million 133 thousand 750 euros, which is considerably less than the initial budget, which was 1.5 million. That was for the year 2022. 
Now, for the year 2023, well, it's the same uh, as the year 2022, and this is uh, subject to your vote under resolution number 14. And now it is for me to uh, highlight our ambitions for employee shareholdership. You may remember that initiative was stepped up last year with a new program which included two items the uh, allocation of free shares to all employees, six shares per employee, and an additional, a second uh, uh, plan which enabled employees to uh, buy uh, Renault shares at a 30% discount. And for the first two uh, shares purchased, uh, there was a topping up uh, of three uh, additional uh, shares thrown in. So there were six free shares and then six additional uh, shares uh, for uh, if for uh, two shares purchased. And, uh, and so 95,000 employees got these six free shares and, an and 40,000 actually took advantage of this uh, offer to buy shares at a discount with free shares thrown in. And so that uh, took the percentage of uh, uh, shareholder of uh, employee shareholdership to 4.7 percent, and this is in line with our commitment to reach 10 percent by the year 2030. And so, our ambition is to renew the same plan in 2023. Now, um, should the additional 30 uh, percent of performance shares uh, to well, related to the uh, uh, implementation of uh, the the strategy in 2023. Well, uh, the similar uh, amount, 30 percent, well, an identical amount, will be uh, then uh, given out to employees. Thank you. I'll give the floor back uh, to our chairman. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this presentation and uh, your consummate art of presenting very simply, very some very complex information. It's very appreciable. So, shareholders, we're now going to move on to a very important part of our AGM that you have been awaiting as impatiently as we have. This is the live Q&A session that we are happy to be able to hold this year. Before we begin our discussion, I would like to inform you that the answers to the written questions sent to us by mail by some shareholders are available on our website. Kitri de Pelport will give you some instructions to ensure that this session goes smoothly. In order to allow as many of you as possible to express your views, we'd be grateful if you could keep your questions direct and short and not go beyond one minute. We ask you to remain seated and to indicate by raising your hand that you wish to ask a question. Hosts and hostesses will then come and hand you a microphone. I will let you know when you can speak. Uh, I would now like to hand over to the chairman for the Q&A session. So before giving you the floor for your first question, I'd like to remind you that the Shareholders Advisory Committee and the Shareholders Day, uh, which was held on this year on the 5th of April, are very important forums for exchanges and discussions. During this day, we were able with Luca de Mio to discuss the group's activity and to have a direct dialogue with a number of shareholders. I hope that we can hold several of these meetings and I hope that they will continue to be as lively as was the case this year with a site visit. And I suggest that we should show you some of the footage shot on the occasion of the Shareholders' Day. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. On est vraiment ravis de vous avoir. Les relations que nous pouvons avoir extraordinairement, je veux dire, ouvertes et, et, et transparentes sont toujours une richesse. Vous êtes avec les collaborateurs de Renault, les deux grands piliers structurant de Renault, nous le ressentons au quotidien. Ça me fait très plaisir parce que je sais que vous êtes très proche de nous et il y a beaucoup d'entre vous qui sont des passionnés d'automobiles. Donc il faut nourrir cette tradition entre nous, Jean qui aimons l'automobile. Au vu des éléments qui nous ont été donnés, on ne peut qu'être confiant dans la stratégie, surtout dans l'évolution de la révolution qu'on vit actuellement dans l'automobile. On part sur une nouvelle feuille de route avec de nouveaux produits, des nouvelles technologies, une nouvelle façon de penser l'automobile. Ce qui va vraiment changer la donne, c'est la métamorphose de Renault en entreprise automobile de nouvelle génération. Euh, évidemment, on est très motivé. J'ai autour de moi une équipe très, très forte. 
très solidaire. L'entreprise automobile de nouvelle génération, c'est un modèle beaucoup plus agile qui permet de s'adapter aux nouvelles tendances du marché. La transformation du groupe telle qu'elle a été pensée par M. Demiro et ses équipes porte beaucoup de lisibilité sur les différentes activités du groupe. Et je pense que ça peut être qu'une démarche positive qui va porter un vent de renouveau. On voit le, les résultats de la renouvelation. On voit la résurrection de Renault, des marques, et notamment de la marque Alpine. Nous avons rencontré des collaborateurs très engagés, passionnés, extrêmement compétents sur leur métier. C'est extrêmement enthousiasmant. Nous sommes tous émerveillés par la capacité de rebond et extrêmement confiants pour l'avenir. Je ressens la fierté des équipes de Renault partout où l'on va dans le groupe. Je ressens même la fierté des regards dans la rue. Ça nous fait du bien. Voilà, c'est une journée, je crois, très réussie. So that was a very successful day. Now, to, to start the Q&A, let me start with a question that was sent in by a shareholder, and then we'll take uh, some questions from the room and uh, and questions that we get through the chat uh, on the internet uh, we decided that we should keep uh, this chat uh, we this means of communication that was set up during the COVID period hello ladies and gentlemen we did understand the uh, organization strategy and you admire it we have understood the originality of your electric strategy but i have a question why are you making so much effort on e-fuels? Well, that's a very current question. Let's give the floor to Luca so that he can answer. So, um, let me give you an answer at the level of Renault or for the European Association of Car Makers. We consider that it's really important and the regulators tell us where we, they want us to go, but nobody knows how. So you have to ensure that engineers can are creative enough to find the right solution. So if the, the enemy is uh, CO2, in, for example, we have to find a way, either you know whichever way we can, to achieve that reduction of CO2. And there's a predominating debate that means that, that says that electric cars can find the solution to this. So for me personally, many of my colleagues, uh, even beyond Renault, believe that the fact that we are open to the discussion of e-fuels means that we can ensure uh, carbon neutrality. We don't really know exactly how it's going to work, whether it is going to work, whether it's going to be just for premium cars or luxury brands like Ferrari or Porsche, because one litre of e-fuel is going to cost 20 euros. We've still got the time to think about it and to find the right solutions. That's what's important. You need to keep in mind that one of the things where Renault is positioned differently from other car, car companies and where we've been more ambitious is that we are looking at this whole subject with the idea of looking at this from the cradle to the grave, so from uh, and not just from the well to the wheel, because all regulations only look at well to wheel. And when you look at the whole life cycle, there are many cases where uh, ICE cars, maybe with new fuels, can actually have an uh, environmental uh, balance sheet that is better than certain electric cars for certain types of use anyway. So we are looking at everything. We do not have blinkers on, and we believe that the idea of low-carbon fuels, e-fuels, all of that cannot be left aside. There's another thing that we have to keep in mind, which is that all regulations talk about new generation products, all the products that are coming in in the future. But we forget that on the planet there are more than 
two billion cars that are on the roads and that are all ICs. So if we want to reduce the impact on the environment immediately, we have to look after that as well. And one of the ways to do that is to invent new fuels that these engines, these old engines from India to China to Latin America, can continue to use. So I think that this is a good opportunity for, from the regulation point of view. Okay, so we, what you're saying is we cannot have a final opinions and we can't express them too firmly because research and technology could take us in a totally different way. And in a few years, maybe the answers that people think are the, the ultimate answers may be completely wrong. I would add that, you know, of course, this is... Uh, Renault is still, for its part, really focused on becoming a leader in electric mobility. That's quite clear. So you know that what we are doing is ensuring that Renault has the right conditions to become 100% electric in 2030. Alpine is going into electric mobility, uh, maybe a little bit of hydrogen. But we need to play on several levels because just like uh, Formula One, Formula One uh, a race, you need to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. If there's a safety car, if, if it rains, things change. So I would say that the main project really is to become a leader in electric mobility. So that's a question that's come in online, which is, what do you plan in terms of new synergies with Nissan and Mitsubishi? It's Mr. Jean-Luc Baudelot who asked the question. Let me answer, let me begin the answer and then Luca will uh, carry on. So, you know, earlier both of us were talking about this new era of the alliance uh, that was opened up by the new agreement that was signed in February. We believe it's going to be a fresh um, operational impetus. In fact, there would have been no, no new agreement if there had not been a clear desire for Renault and Mitsubishi and Nissan to launch new industrial operations worldwide. So no matter what happens, where, or where we are all based, Latin America, Europe, India, these are the three main examples where we know that we are going to be creating a lot of value. And we told you about that not very long ago. Now, beyond this, it's quite obvious that the Ampere and Horse projects uh, obviously do have a role to play in this uh, landscape. And we know that Nissan and Mitsubishi will be joining Ampere and their clients of Horse. So that's a lot of synergy, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, operational synergies. Luca de Meo. Well, you've already uh, laid out a lot of things, but I think that we need to keep in mind that the agreements that we've made, that we've signed, are actually agreements at three levels. And it starts because at the base of all of this, we have at least 10 projects in which we found a common uh, interest in working, which could uh, generate potentially hundreds of million, millions or even billions if we're good at this. So, And th these I'm talking about figures per year for each of the companies in terms of value creation. You know, there, there's this word, synergy, you know, which everybody has used and misused for so long. So there's synergies, there's possibilities of creating value. So keep in mind that this um, uh, agreement we signed in February has really reactivated the business arrangement between M Nissan and Mitsubishi and Renault to a level that we hadn't seen for years. And so, as the chairman was saying, on the one hand, it's an opportunity for us to create horse with other partners because it has become extremely urgent for us as a European company which has to face very, very quick and very severe regulations that's pushing us towards electric cars. But at the same time, we will have so that, that will give us a possibility to work with Nissan and Mitsubishi on Ampere. And on the other hand, it might help us rebalance things. The, the idea of this is to come back to a position where we have a relationship between these three companies that's quite normal. And that's going to make us uh, help us to be more serene, more tranquil, and at 
at, at an everyday level to work on different projects. Things are going pretty well. We've already set up some very good things with Mitsubishi. We've pr proposed a project, a product uh, to them for Europe. Nissan has announced that they will be uh, building a car in Douai, an electric car with us. We are going to be doing things together in India that we'll be able to go into more detail about in the months to come and in Latin America as well. So from an operational point of view, really, this is going to boost all three companies. And that's what's most important. We want to be focused on business with Nissan. We don't want to go into politics. We don't want to meddle in any uh, high polluting strategy or anything. We want to have a very pragmatic strategy, a very pragmatic approach, and we're going to make good business with them. Yes, I think that that's very clear, says Jean-Dominique Sénard, because everyone's understood that one of the central aspects of this agreement is to do away with all the frustrations that both sides had, that really, in sh you know, people were cold to each other because they didn't trust each other. Thank God that period is now behind us. And as Lucas just said, we are now looking forward to a future that is bright with a lot of potential. Now, do you have any questions in the room? I, I see, can see mic, mic number five here. Gent you, that gentleman, yes, do please go ahead. Yes, uh, hello. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm an individual shareholder and I have been uh, for, uh, for several decades in, uh, f that I bought uh, in cash. Nobody matched my contribution or gave me cash. But I'm losing money on both sides because I'm a shareholder in both French automotive groups. I remember being shocked in 2018 by the uh, payments to the, the CEO and the chairman at the time, 5,000 performance shares with a huge salary. And that was 10 million that was added to the 5 million uh, uh, s annual salary, that was 15 million. But at the time, the share cost 100 euros. And at the time of Mr. Louis Schweitzer, when we um, uh, bought our shares in Nissan, 44%, I believe it was, today you are reducing that to 15%. Fine, I understand. I understand the ja that the Japanese were annoyed because they didn't have uh, shares in Renault's capital, whereas we had almost half of their cap shares of their capital. But a lot of the benefits that of the profits that Renault declared came from Nissan. So I can see that we're getting better because today to the CEO, who's a very nice guy, and I love Italy, but the salary is still three and a half million between fixed and variable. And 75,000 sh free shares. So earlier we had stock options. You know, you can either op you can either use them or not. If the share has gone down, then obviously the person who owns those stock options is not going to take them. They haven't won anything, but they haven't lost anything. Me, as an individual uh, shareholder, when we buy our shares, we pay for them, and when the share goes down, we lose capital. And if they sell off their shares, they actually make a loss. And, you know, this is what I what has happened to me. So I'm surprised to see the 75,000 free shares, performance, so-called performance shares. I don't really look at uh, the share price anymore. So if you look at what the price of uh, the Renault share was, when Mr. Schweitzer was in charge and when he he gave uh, to uh, he uh, handed the relay over to Carlos Ghosn. Well, there's another Carlos who is today at the head of the your competitor, PSA Stellantis. I think he gets 23 million euros. Why should we stop there? So I just wonder why uh, beyond the uh, uh, 75,000 shares, free shares. I think you bought 8,000 some shares. Why are you sh matching those 8,000 shares? I pay for my shares and nobody gives me any matching shares. 
and I haven't made any money at all with either of the automotive groups. So my question is, I can see that these gentlemen uh, of the board of directors went to J Japan. Did they travel economy class? Well, I'll give you an answer, and I can I can uh, do this without any problems. Let me stay uh, be very clear with you we did go to japan and it does happen that uh, that the board members of nissan came to us and we traveled business class clearly these are very long trips they uh, last 15 hours now because we can't use russian airspace so you can understand that the teams who accompany us have a very very busy lives there is nothing to apologize for here it is quite sure it is quite clear that we only travel business and I myself, I have never used anything other than a normal airline uh, aeroplane since I was appointed chairman. Now, as far as the uh, uh, the this goes, I am not enthusiastic. Okay. So let me remind you that a few weeks ago, the price was about 43 euros, and if there's been a change, quite a brutal. Uh, change over the last few weeks. It's certainly not l due to Renault as such. As you know, that is due to the general economic context and uh, to the economic uh, future prospects and maybe maybe other movements that some competitors made in the market that uh, sent uh, different messages. And as you can see that Renault's position is getting better and better, and I'm quite sure that the market will recognize that very quickly. But you're right. It was 100 euros at one point. But when I got to the group, it, the, the share price was already going down quite a bit. And it was my job to show the reality of Renault's accounts in 2020 when we had uh, uh, the uh, we had to uh, chalk up the so the loss which was a the biggest loss that France uh, that Renault's ever had but at least it was we told you the truth and i promise you that the share price is going to go back up again i promise you please trust us as far as uh, the um, um uh, the ceo's price uh, CEO's salary goes, I, I assure you, it's very moderate if you look at the comparison of in, in comparison to other companies. And what you call share, free shares are actually not free shares. These are shares that are attributed over three years of performance, and they are, these performance targets are extremely ambitious. And if by any chance for the group, these conditions were all to be achieved. Nobody would complain about the performance of the group. So I think you need to look at this in, 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 in with serenity. I do believe that we need to be moderate, but with a CEO, we have a CEO that's probably one of the best in the in the sector and i knew when he agreed to join us i knew that we would have someone who would really take the team to heights of success that we had not known before and if you want to make a few comparisons and i'm sure you've done that you'll see that renault is very reasonable and and I promise you that we are very moderate in the way we live, in the way the CEO lives, and in the way we travel and live. Thank you very much for your question. So let me, we'll come back to this side later. Let's take number three. Yes, it's okay, I can hold, I can hold the microphone. Yes, De Soulange for API, the Association for Individual Share Shareholders. You chose this uh, hall, which is a beautiful one, where normally you have uh, a light and sound. So we've got the light. Do you plan next year to also give us the sound of these beautiful models? That's what I mean. So my question actually concerns the fact that a company, as we've understood, 
is not cannot be summed up in figures, even though those figures are important for the market. It is made up of men and women, or women and men. And could you maybe tell us exactly how you are acting in order to attract, but also to keep the right talents that you really need in order for this group to give of its best. And my second question, we do appreciate this industrial group, which is a French group. Partnered with the Japanese company, you've done a lot of good work for the governance. The chairman now is no longer the same as the CEO, although we are quite happy for the CEO to join the board of directors. You have a lead director. What are you really doing to attract to attract institutional investors, especially Anglo-Saxon uh, institutional investors? That's my question. Yes, now for attracting of talents, let's start with that. I think Francois would have, uh, Francois Roger, who is our human resources director, would probably be able to answer much better than I would. But I think, frankly, let's not forget that Renault is a glorious company. When uh, Jean Dominique called me, you know, I started my career in Renault, and I've, I had always had a very, very positive idea of the culture of this company and uh, of the company in general. So I think that we are among the most uh, attractive companies in the in this industry. And the automotive industry is actually quite an attractive one for many categories of people. I believe that people want a company that has a clear history, that has a clear plan for the future, and they look at the dynamics of the company and see whether it has potential. And when I arrived a couple of, you know, two and a half years ago, we were all deep in trouble, all of us together. And I kept hearing, you know, people in Renault kept telling me people are leaving, people are switching companies. And now I feel that we've turned that around. And I think that we are receiving people from the other side now. You know, success attracts people, so we need to continue. If you want to have, if you want to attract talents, you have to succeed. There's one angle that's important for us, and I think that that is clearly within the tradition of Renault, which is, you know, now they call it ESG, you know, the social or the labor part, the fact that we pay attention to the community, that we uh, pay attention to the environment. So for a company like a company like Renault, I think it's a huge opportunity for us to, to position ourselves because younger generations are extremely sensitive to the ethics and the environmental um, attention of, company, of companies and the kind of uh, attention that companies pay also to uh, uh, the social questions. And that's in the DNA of Renault. So that's why it is, it's not something that we just put into a brochure to present it during our AGM or our financial results. We've really placed it at the heart of our system because we are quite convinced that this is what will make the difference. This will give us the competitive edge, even on the uh, recruitment market. And I may never have told you this, but in 1990 I, or 1991, I wrote my thesis. And my first one was on business ethics. There was nothing, nothing at the time. Even in Europe, really, ethics was not something that you know nobody really cared about. There was, um, it was no fun. But my concept, which is a very basic one at the time, is that there is a correlation 
between the value and the competitiveness of a company and its ethics, ethical and moral qualities. So I have believed in this for a very long time. And I'm very comfortable in Renault with Jean Dominique and with our teams because I believe that we all have the same sort of moral vision that I believe will attract uh, uh, new, new recruits, especially of the younger generation. Yes, I think I can add to what Luca has just said because it is thanks to his concept of the way a company should be managed and his the way uh, his way of delegating uh, responsibility uh, to people is really one of the elements that really pushed us to uh, recruit Luca. That's why I recommended him so intensely to the board. And I said that in at the beginning, this was one of the major criteria that I had in mind. So, and, uh, you know, I think the finance uh, director can answer your second question better than me. But we are not having any difficulty in attracting Anglo-Saxon in institutional investors. In fact, they seem to be very attracted to us right now. And the only comment I could make is that I would be very happy if French investors took a, took a better interest in Renault, frankly. But now I think I'm going to give the floor to Thierry Pieton. Yes, you're right, Jean-Dominique. There is a significant part of our pool of investors which are Anglo-Saxon. You know, they are English and American first. And what are their main concerns? Well, their main concerns, like any other investor, is performance. And you've seen in our figures that performance is beginning to appear and the expectations that they have both for the short term and the long term because they want a clear strategy for the group. That's one of the reasons why we held this event in November. We had this Capital Market Day to explain our strategy and the uh, Anglo-Saxon investors that we want to attract primarily are those that have uh, a long-term strategy with Renault and so we are uh, making a lot of efforts to try and explain exactly how the group is going to evolve and to convince them of the performance that you can see today is already improving and we want to convince them that it's going to continue to evolve with a structural evolution as well in the future. They're also very much interested in the ESG. So we have this on, uh, we, we, they can see the difference in our governance, in the figures that we've, uh, uh, we've uh, chalked up over the last uh, few years as well. So their ethical and financial ex expectations are there. So we need to communicate very clearly about what we're doing. So part of that communication is being done through regular uh, events like uh, the fact that we publish our results uh, quarterly and half yearly. We also have a very, very active communication plan with investors. Last year, we met about 2,000 investors over the year, and uh, we took part in uh, um, uh, conferences on the auto se uh, automotive sector, especially. We held road shows in the U.S. Typically, we go with the investor relations team uh, who is here and with Luca and some of the members of the management team to the U.S. We do that quite regularly. We go to London even more regularly to meet these investors and explain to them uh, the, the work that we've already carried out and the work that we, that we are planning to carry out so that they know exactly where we are going. So this is something that is going quite well because as Jean-Dominique told you, if you look at the makeup of our uh, shareholding over the last few months, you can see that Anglo-Saxon investors have really ramped up. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the same progress from French investors. So we have to also do what we can to solve that problem. Thank you very much. So that was clear. I'd just like to add, says Mr. Senar, that beyond all the work that we've done with worldwide investors, your uh, chairman, that's me, and our lead director every year also meet with investors very regularly regularly in terms of to explain their our governance to them. And we are really out on the road very, very regularly. Okay, let's continue. Let me go 
uh, on the other side and take uh, number four now, if you don't mind asking your question. Yes, thank you very much for taking my question. I have a question concerning the buyback of shares. You said it was not to give back the sh profits to shareholders. So why aren't you doing that? You, you said that you you talked about the uh, shareholding plan for employees, but you've bought back a lot more shares than you are giving to your employees. So why have you bought back so many shares? Okay, thank you very much. Why are we not buying back shares just for our uh, employee shareholding? It's for a very simple reason. It's because we've gone through some very difficult times financially to such an extent that the net debt of the automotive branch was negative. And the financial robustness of the group was take, brought into question at that time. And the rating agencies brought down our score, which means that it makes it much more difficult for us to raise money from the market, to take loans from the market, and it became much more expensive to do that. So our short-term aim is to reestablish the financial robustness of the group. And in order to do that, we've got to be able to reinvest a lot of uh, the, uh, sh the capital that we generate into the development of our new activities, the development of our new vehicles, and all of that, rather than to pull out cash from the scope of the group to pay our uh, shareholders. So obviously, the, the price of the share is something that we are very concerned about, as well as paying our dividends. Obviously, we are not happy. With the share of the, with the price of the share as it stands today, but the priority was to reinforce the solid the financial robustness of the group in the short term. Term to come back to an investment grade rating by the rating agencies, and that is uh, you know uh, is something that doesn't happen when you buy up shares with the cash of the group. So the buyback that happened over the la over the preceding years was done mainly linked to the employee shareholding plan, share ownership plan, and the bonuses that we talked about earlier. For 2022, we set up what we call a liquidity contract with an external bank whose aim is to limit the volatility of our uh, share price by giving the capacity to a banking establishment to carry out operations in our name on Renault shares. So this is something that we set up last year. And most of the CAC 40 companies do the same thing. The advantage, of course, is to ensure that the share price doesn't go up and down too much. The operations that we carried out in 2022 were higher than usual. But for 23 and 24, the main use of the shares that we will make will be to give shares to our employees. That was very clear. Let me center our questions and let me take uh, sign number two. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. I also am a member of uh, f the French individual shareholders. I have several quick questions to ask you, if you don't mind. First of all, I'd like to know what was the future of the automotive industry in France? What is P Renault's position concerning the decision taken on the 14th of February 2023 by the European Parliament to uh, forbid any IC uh, engines for any new cars built after from 2025 onwards? And I'd also like to know what is the truth? What is the reality of the market? This, I, these uh, Chinese uh, electric cars that we are going to see from the first quarter of 2023. So, you know, we keep hearing about this, and uh, the media talk about uh, the market being flooded with uh, Chinese electric cars. And also, you talked about battery recycling. Um, with your investment in the future is neutral. So what is your first uh, resource uh, for 
uh, electric batteries. One last point as well. I saw in the documents, and you've emphasized this a lot, this is one of your, the key figures of the performance of 2022. It's your uh, operating margin and the famous free cash flow of 2.112 billion in uh, 2022. So you started from a net result, net profit of uh, the automotive activity in 2022, uh, and then you came back down, and then given the investments carried out in 2022, that's about 2.2 billion, I believe, 2.2 uh, billion euros net because there was 400 million euros of uh, divestments. So that gives you a billion, 2 billion, 119 million euros. So this is automotive activity. So what is the impact of the flows that from activity that's been interrupted? Because you have a net profit of 2.3 billion euros negative for the activities that were halted in 2022. I presume that that is really Russia, that really concerns Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for your question. So I think maybe uh, the, uh, our CFO can answer the last question. Yes. In terms of the free cash flow, what you said was completely right. We are talking about the net. Uh, result of uh, continued activities, and we correct that from uh, we correct that by non-cash and nets. We deduct investments that have been done. We uh, carry up, we add on the product of divestments, and we add uh, working capital requirement, and all of this uh, leads to 2.1 billion of income cash generated for 2022. Now. For the 2.3 billion of net profit on discontinued activities, so loss, sorry, uh, is really the write-off of the assets that we had in Russia. So it is a non-cash expense. So there is very little cash impact of our stopping of our activities in Russia. If you look at the variation of the net debt of the automotive branch on the right-hand side of the free cash flow, I think you have about 165 million of negative flows for, on, for discontinued activities. That's it. So that big element of 2.1 billion, which is non-cash, that's the depreciation of uh, tangible and, non in, and intangible assets that we owned in Russia. So I'll, uh, v you said you were going to be very quick, but you actually asked me about what I think of the future of the automotive industry after 2035, about China, all of that. So I'd need a lot of time to answer that. So now for us, for 2035, we pushed for that deadline to be pushed to 2040, because we considered that 2035 was too early. European authorities, they decided that in Europe that was going to be 2035. It's not, we don't make the rules. We just have to adapt uh, to follow them, that's all. So I can tell you, you know, privately, but 2035 is a huge challenge, but we have to manage it. So that's why we are pushing on electric cars, because given the way the rules have been built today, it's only through electric cars that we'll be able to completely decarbonize our lineup. We talked about the opportunity with the new fuels, you know, the e-fuels and all that. I think that's good news because it gives us a bit of a breathing space, but we don't have a choice. We have to do it. And Europe is the only region in the, the entire world where we have such a stringent objective with, with you know, such a short deadline. We, but we just have to live with it. As far as China is concerned, this is a very serious question. 
the potential that ele that Chinese car makers have, especially for electric cars, is very important. I believe we can match them technologically. I believe we can make cars at the same level as Chinese car makers. But what we need is time. You need to keep in mind that China came to electric cars one generation before Europeans. And they did organize themselves with the values chain and all of that from the sourcing of raw materials, you know, with total control over the mines, then processing and refining of the materials, of the metals, and right up to making the batteries. They put in the right infrastructure and they boosted the market where you now have an internal demand for six to seven million electric cars, whereas in Europe the demand is about one million. So what we want is firstly a little bit more time so that during this ramping up period we should be supported or protected in a way from uh, unfair competition that would make our lives very difficult while we are in a phase in while we are in this transitional phase and i believe personally that we need to find the right conditions you know to have a level playing field so when europeans went to china they went they had certain conditions it worked. We all took advantage of it. I think our Chinese customers also had a good deal, I believe. So now that we are going to start importing Chinese cars into Europe, the rules have to be more or less the same as the rules that were imposed on us when we went to the Chinese market. They have a good advantage. They make good cars. There's a certain control of the whole ecosystem that's already been set up. Now, as far as recycling goes, I, I did talk about it in the beginning. So to uh, come to a point where for recycling, for us in Renault, we have one advantage. We started making electric cars ten, over 10 years ago. So I believe that we are very well positioned because we have the batteries of the Zoes and the fluences that we made many years ago, they are coming, they are now beginning to come back to us because the battery lasts 10 to 15 years. Whereas our competitors will see maybe a few hundred or a few dozen batteries trickle in, we have lots of used batteries coming in. And in terms of recycling, one of the most important sources of materials is going to be the waste from all of the products that are going into the gigafactories that we are setting up to make batteries. You may not know that before we get to the level of scrap, which is, you know, a very small percentage, it takes a long time. But at the beginning, there are many batteries that are not at the right level of quality. And so they are they are ruled out. And all of that material is put, in, put back into uh, recycling. And so we are having two gigafactories in France, one with Envision AESC in Douai, and the second one in with Vercor in Dunkirk. So we are organizing all of the flow of resources. And I think that Renault is definitely going to have a competitive edge with that. And you asked me what are our sources for batteries. I've already mentioned the first two, and the third one is going to be a relationship that we've had historically with our friends in LG who are in Korea that uh, we brought into the automotive sector 15 years ago and with whom we've always managed to work very, very closely. So I think that that was a quick answer to all your questions. Thank you very much. I think that does answer your questions. And 
it's true that you know this question of the Chinese car makers is not something that surprises me because during the very first AGM that I chaired here as the chairman of Renault, I talked about this risk of the of Chinese industry compared to ours, and at the time. I was alone, but I had been vaccinated by what I learned when I was at the head of a French tire company that you are familiar with. So I was not surprised at all. So I think that before we took this decision at the level of Europe, we should have analyzed the impact of the, this, uh, the dependency uh, that this would mean. We should have looked at it in more detail earlier. Now, you know, things are the way they are, and Luca is quite right. We just have to apply the regulations. That's all we can do. But I'd like to add one thing, says Luca de Mayo. We saw the Americans, then we saw the Japanese coming into Europe, then the Koreans, and we're still here. It's just competition. That's all it is. So, you know, we haven't died. So I think in general, I don't think we uh, you know, of course, you know, China, the Chinese companies are creating a lot of value and a lot and adding a lot of technology. We just have to learn to fight. That's all. We just have to learn to make better cars that are more competitive. Okay, let me continue. Let's take sign number one. We've still got a little bit of time left. So let's take as many questions as we can. So if your question is short, the answer will be short. Michel Cougra, I'm an individual shareholder. I find it very difficult to understand what exactly you're going to do with the shares that are going to be given to the CEO or to the employees. Are you creating shares, which would obviously penalize an, uh, existing shareholders, or are you buying on the market with the resolutions of the previous years that have not been completely used up? Or you also talked about this possibility of you talked about certain mechanisms that you might use to regulate, you know, regulate the uh, price of the share. This is something that I've seen in banking about 50 years ago. So how are you going to manage this this year? How are you going to do this? Thierry, yes, thank you for the question. Actually, we are not issuing new new shares because obviously that would dilute, dilute uh, uh, the holding of other shareholders. So during this AGM, every year we ask you for the authorization to buy back shares with the delegation that's given to the board of directors, which then delegates its authority to the management team. And then we go onto the market and we buy as many shares as we believe we need uh, to fulfill the employee shareholder plan. That's it. So we'd also like to tell the, pol the politicians who obviously don't understand uh, these buyback operations, you should maybe explain to them that it's in the interest of employees and of the company and not just uh, to add, uh, you know, add to, share, <laughs> to, uh, to enrich shareholders. Yes. Yes, I would like to thank you for that. I think that the French state does understand very clearly exactly what Renault is trying to do. And I'd like, I'd like to say that uh, in front of the state representative on our board of directors. So it's very clear. They do understand very clearly. Okay. So the IPO, that's another question. Ampere IPO is going to take place early 2024. What impact is this going to have on Renault shareholders? The Volkswagen Group did the IPO of Porsche, and the shares went uh, flew up, but the shares of Volkswagen stayed at the same level as before the IPO. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to put the ball into the CFO's court. Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, our objective with Ampere is to create an electric franchise or an electric company that's going to be as efficient and as high performance as possible. 
So the first step to do this is to have a separate activity with people who are own, who who live, breathe, and eat and drink electric cars. That's it. So the first step is to create an activity that is totally dedicated and has all of the chances and 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 has all of it, all of the uh, advantages on its side with the resources. So that means you have to have access to capital. So of course you could pull, uh, you could uh, dip into the resources of the group. And you know earlier I did say that our objective today is to reinforce the balance sheet of the group and to and to make it more robust financially or on the other hand we could uh, we could go to the market if we go to the market it means we can inject additional resources to develop this activity without pulling on the cash reserves of the group the advantage for Renault's shareholders is that by doing this we make it possible for Ampere to develop more easily, to grow more quickly, and to develop more products and to better integrate the value chain. So if I'm a Renault shareholder, I should see the potential IPO of Ampere as being a lever that is going to improve the performance of Ampere and therefore the performance of the Renault Group as a whole. So we have to be very clear. This is why we're doing it. This is why we're carrying out this operation to ensure that Ampere has all the advantages that it needs and Ampere becomes a very, very significant part of the operations of the group because our aim is to be 100% electric by 2030 for a retail car, um, uh, passenger cars, and it's Ampere that's going to bring us this contribution. So we need to see it like an access to extra cash to develop a key activity for the future of the group in general. Thank you, Thierry. That's really clear. So let me go into a zone that I haven't been into uh, earlier. That's, uh, let's take sign number two. Hello, my name is Vincent Grin. I'm uh, uh, a shareholder and an employee, so in line with uh, Fabio's question just now, on <laughs> everyday terms, as a layman firm, to uh, put the right uh, equipment on Ampere and to go to the market, it means you are taking assets from Renault plants. and. And is it the case that the Renault shareholder will find itself uh, short change? In which case, what can you <laughs> what can you do to protect the shareholder? That, that uh, was held in. That was a short question, but yes, uh, says Thierry Pieton. Uh, we are not going to uh, open up the capitals uh, in uh, with the risk that Renault might lose its majority. So uh, even if the IPO takes place, uh, Renault will still keep a strong majority. And so uh, the Ampere business uh, will uh, be consolidated uh, in the group's account. So there'll still be a subsidiary of Renault where there will be also minority shareholders. But for um, uh, uh, Renault, this is an option given to uh, Ampere to have access to uh, outside capital, an opportunity to grow faster. And so uh, <coughs> I'm pulling uh, figures out of the hat. Don't take them uh, as uh, actual guidance. But it's much better to be, say, a 75% shareholder of something that, is, uh, that generates $2 billion a year than uh, to be a 100% shareholder of something that only generates uh, 0.5 or $1 billion. So we but uh, we uh, take all necessary steps to be uh, uh, the main shareholder at the right level. And you can be concerned that uh, uh, the, the team of Renault and Luca in particular will see to it that Renault's interests and Renault's shareholders' interests uh, are fully preserved. And that will be, of course, a major concern. Uh, may I add something, says Luca Di Meo? Well, um, if we leave uh, the actual Ampere project aside, uh, the industrial project, uh, electric plus software are separate sports. Uh, they have different cycles. The value chain is different. So what is it that we're taking uh, from Renault that is now being put into Ampere? Well, we have Douai. Douai, unfortunately, 
had little future. One, when we, uh, uh, in the previous cycle, uh, we had uh, six or seven models that were supposed to uh, make 300,000 cars and they only produced uh, 70,000. We have uh, routes that build gearboxes for IC engines and now they will be uh, making, well, boxes to, to hold uh, batteries. Cléon, Cléon used to make IC engines. We have a deal with Valeo uh, to uh, build the biggest uh, electric car plant in Europe. And so, uh, it is true, we took from the Renault Group, but we give a, we, we give a future back to uh, these sites thanks to the Ampere project. It used to be, well, we were able to uh, to attract two companies to build two gigafactories in northern France. At some point, we uh, estimated that uh, well, we had an operation, the operation in northern France with electricity and Ampere. Uh, the uh, implied investment, uh, not by Renault, by investors, amount to 20 billion euros. Do you, I mean, are we taking away from Renault, or, or rather, are we getting back? Uh, returning to France, its automotive industry. I believe it is ra rather the latter because uh, we are being brave enough to recognize that the future is there, we're going there, and we're trying to be leaders in there. And that means specialization. Like when you change sports, you have to practice every day, uh, in and out, day in and day out. And, and that is how you achieve performance at Ampere. And I don't think we're taking away from Renault, far from it, the other way around, in fact. Well, that's crystal clear. Listen, we're getting close to the end of... OK, I'll take the very last question. And then for uh, members of the public who were not uh, able to put their questions, and I do thank you for this exchange. This is a fruitful discussion. And if you have additional questions, you can turn to our um, uh, PR people and you can get a question, an answer. But OK, question number four now. My name is Jean-Pierre uh, Dufour. I'm also a Renault employee and a empl Renault shareholder. I had a question about the consequences on, on our shares of the uh, steps you're taking. Uh, are we looking at a capital increase or dilution of uh, our shares? The answer, we got your answers, and that's fine. On horse, horse is no longer uh, that no longer comes under Renault Group. Is this to say that they have a, a different future? Is this to say that uh, the accounts for horse will no longer be consolidated by Renault? Can you give us uh, some color on that? Well, yes, the big difference between Ampere and horse is that as regards uh, ICE, uh, engines and gearboxes uh, that are outside France and transferred to horse, uh, we have created joint venture with Gili and Aramco, and, and there we would no, no longer be uh, majority shareholders. So that would be indeed deconsolidated. And so what we're trying to do, we, we build an equipment manufacturer uh, uh, with a critical mass, with a huge critical mass, which will become a supplier to Renault and seven other companies. So we take assets that were dedicated to the manufacturing of uh, IC engines and gearboxes, whose future was uh, uncertain, which probably did not have the long-term critical mass uh, to survive to go it alone. We bring, we uh, add to these assets those of Gili, and that together brings an equipment manufacturer that will cover 19 countries, covering indeed all the segments, uh, all the uh, levels of engine uh, with customers around the world. And uh, for Horse, we're looking at eight customers, so seven customers uh, apart from Renault. So that business will have uh, a long-term future. Um, and in so doing, the uh, synergies uh, created in terms of procurement, uh, development, and the like, uh, the synergies will be such that, uh, that we will be uh, will come cheaper than when we built them ourselves in-house. So for uh, Renault shareholders, 
this is a plus because it means our cost structure is uh, is uh, streamlined, that we remain s strong shareholders in a company which will be structurally profitable and generate cash in the long run. So we remain shareholders in a company that will potentially uh, pay out dividends in the future. So to sum up, we are taking some assets which alone uh, might not have much of a future, and we, uh, with them, we build a company that does have substance, that does have a long-term future, together with an external partner with significant uh, know-how and plus a financial and technological partner, Aramco, which will enable us to develop that business because, of course, it is in that partner's interest to make sure that we continue uh, building a uh, clean and efficient ICE engine. So that's the idea. Uh, and there's a shareholders agreement that will uh, protect uh, Renault's position, and so uh, nothing can be decided without uh, Renault's uh, assent on all strategic issues, and that should also be pointed out. Well, that is part of the conversation we are having with our potential partners. Uh, Renault's size in Horth, well, it's well balanced, and so the assets brought in by uh, Geely and uh, by Renault, and indeed the uh, prospects on either side are such that the uh, the, the weight is uh, essentially equal. So we have a partnership which is. But it is well leaving out Amco, which comes in just with the uh, with the money. But between Gili and us, it's a 50. I beg your pardon, Gili Volvo and us. Uh, we are 50-50 with the two companies. So we have it is both our interest to develop uh, business. All right. Well, look, I believe that has answered the question. But you do need to understand that that business will uh, reveal significant value compared to the uh, present situation where everybody somehow is under the impression that this business is of no value at all. And as <laughs> Renault shareholders, I'm sure you'll be happy to uh, find this uh, come to the fore in the months to come. So in any case, thank you. And thank you for this uh, high-level discussion. Interesting question. So well, I'm afraid for Q&A, we have come to an end of that uh, session. This takes us to the uh, vote of rev resolutions. And without further ado, I'll give the floor to Kitri de Belper. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, shareholders, the present meeting is called to vote on 17 resolutions, of which 16 are ordinary and one is extraordinary. Before presenting each of the resolutions and letting you vote on them, I must inform you that the total number of shares held by the shareholders present or represented amounts to 159,719,428 shares, uh, with uh, voting rights for ordinary resolutions, 64.47%, 4 and again, 159,719,428 shares, or 64.47% of the shares with voting rights for extraordinary resolutions. The quorum required for the validity of deliberations of both the ordinary and extraordinary part is reached. I would also like to remind you that in accordance with the governance agreements of 4 February 2016, the state's votes are subject to a cap depending on the quorum level. Thus, the states, the governments, the French government's votes are capped at 17.9 percent of the voting rights for all resolutions with the exception of the third resolution. And so, therefore, above this third, this threshold, the French state's voting rights will be exercised in a new matter, manner, i.e. half for and half against for re ordinary resolutions and two-thirds for and one-third against for the extraordinary resolution. Let's not look at a video telling you how to use the voting box. Mesdames et messieurs les actionnaires, le boîtier qui vous a été remis à l'issue de l'émargement est strictement personnel. Le nombre de voix que vous détenez et ou représentez est chargé dans le boîtier et affiché sur son écran. Vous n'aurez à utiliser que les touches vertes, jaunes et rouges. La touche verte correspond à un vote pour. La touche jaune correspond à un vote abstention. La touche rouge correspond à un vote contre. Après la lecture de chacune des résolutions, 
il sera immédiatement procédé à son vote et il sera déclaré « Le vote est ouvert ». À cet instant, vous apercevrez sur l'écran un rectangle vous indiquant le compte à rebours des secondes dont vous disposez pour voter. Lorsque le compte à rebours sera achevé, il sera déclaré « Le scrutin est clos » et il ne vous sera alors plus possible de voter. L'affichage des résultats s'effectuera sur l'écran de projection quelques instants après la clôture du scrutin. Dernière précision, merci de bien vouloir éteindre vos téléphones portables pendant la durée du vote et de restituer les boîtiers à la sortie de la salle. Si personne ne sollicite d'explications complémentaires. So, uh, unless you have you need additional explanations, we'll start with the resolutions first. For the ordinary resolutions, first resolution, the purpose is to approve the annual accounts for the year 2022, showing a profit of 363 million 637,277 euros and 74 cents. I'll remind you that this concerns the result of the Renault SA and not the consolidated result of the Renault Group, which is the subject of the following resolution. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is closed. Cette résolution est And adaptée. The resolution is adopted. The second resolution, the purpose is to approve the consolidated accounts for 2022, showing a loss of 699 million 655,850 euros and 46 cents. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is closed. Cette résolution est adoptée. This resolution is adopted. Number three, the purpose is to allocate the uh, results for the financial year 2022, set the dividend. It is proposed to set at 25 cents the amount of the dividend to be distributed to each of the company's shares entitled to the dividend for the year 2022, or a total amount of 72,602,830 euros and 75 cents. The remainder of the result will be allocated to retained earnings, the balance of which will be in Increased to nine billion nine hundred seven million seven hundred thirty three thousand five hundred forty four euros and twenty four cents. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. The vote is adopted. The resolution is adopted, rather. Number four proposes to take note of the statutory auditor's reports on the elements to determine the amount of compensation uh, for the redeemable shares. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is over and the resolution is adopted. And resolution number five proposes to take note of information relating to uh, related party agreements uh, concluded in previous years and continued in 2022, as described in the statutory auditor's report, as well as the fact that no uh, related party agreement was concluded, new agreement was concluded in 2022. Please vote now. Voting is closed and the resolution was carried. Resolution number six proposes to renew the term of office of Jean-Dominique Senard for a period of four years. I should like to inform you that subject to the approval of this resolution, Mr. Senard will be reappointed as chairman of the board of directors at the end of this AGM. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is closed and the resolution is carried as well. We move on to resolution number seven, which is to renew the term of office of Mrs. Annette Vinclair for a period of four years. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is closed. 
And the resolution is adopted. Number eight, uh, to appoint Mr. Luca Di Meo as a director for a period of four years. Please vote now. Voting is closed. Cette résolution est adoptée. And the resolution is carried. La neuvième résolution soumet à votre approval. Resolution number nine submits for your approval the information relating to the compensation paid during or awarded in respect of the in respect of the financial year 2022 to all corporate offices. Please vote now. Voting is closed and the resolution is adopted. Number 10 submits for your approval the compensation package paid during or awarded in respect of the uh, 2022 financial year to Mr. Jean-Dominique Sénard, Chairman of the Board. Please vote now. Voting is closed, and the resolution is adopted. The 11th resolution submits for your approval the compensation package paid during or awarded in respect of the 2022 financial year to Mr. Luca Di Meo, Chief Executive Officer. Please vote now. Voting is closed. And the resolution is adopted. Number 12 proposes to approve the compensation policy, policy for the chairman of the board of directors for the year 2023. Please vote now. Voting is closed. And the resolution is carried. Number 13 proposes to approve the compensation policy for the chief executive officer for the year 2023. Please vote now. Voting is closed and the resolution Adopted. Number 14 proposes to approve the compensation policy of, uh, for directors for the year 2023. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Cette résolution est adoptée. La 15e résolution a pour objet d'autoriser le Conseil d'administration à acheter et vendre des actions. Number 15, the proposal is to authorize the board of directors to buy and sell shares in the company for a maximum period of 18 months and up to a limit of 10% of the capital. That's the authorization allowing the capital to implement its share buyback program. Please vote now. Le vote est clos. Voting is closed. And the resolution is carried. This takes us to resolution number 16, to authorize the board of directors to reduce the company's capital by canceling chairs for a maximum period of 18 months and up to a limit of 10% of the capital. This resolution linked to the previous one on the share buyback program. Please vote now. Voting is closed, and the resolution was adopted. And 17th resolution aims to grant the necessary powers to carry out the legal formalities required at the end of this meeting. Please vote now. Voting is closed. And the resolution is adopted. So we will put uh, resolution number eight. Apparently, there was uh, a technical snag when the results came out. Resolution uh, number eight was, of course, uh, an important decision because it concerned uh, the appointment of Luca as director. This was adopted. We can 
move on to the next slide with the final results. And you, as you can see, this resolution was carried well. Very good. All right, so all the resolutions were put to the vote. The detailed results of the votes will be posted on the company's website, and I now give the floor back to the chairman to close this AGM. Well, thank you, Kitri, and on behalf of uh, Luca and uh, the team around me, the management team, I would like to thank you for your votes. Uh, on the resolutions that were put to your vote. I'd like to thank you for your presence, for the quality of your questions, and of course, uh, for voting uh, in a positive way. Finally, a few personal words, because you decided to renew my mandate and uh, and uh, renew uh, the uh, the trust in me. Um, of course, uh, this is very humbling, and I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I would like to say that the four years I have spent with you have probably been among the most exciting of my professional life. I thought I had seen and heard everything. I thought I had achieved um, every leader's dream. I thought I had been through a lot of crises, and I was wrong. The last four years, needless to say, uh, were not uh, uh, the easiest. Uh, I experienced moments I had uh, I didn't ex uh, imagine either in uh, in stress or success. Uh, the work with Luca, with the board, with you shareholders, and of course the uh, leaders of the alliance and the various stakeholders of the group. And these uh, four years have enabled the teams to achieve an exceptional turnaround that makes me particularly proud. I would like to say this. This is commensurate with the talents of this formidable company whose heart beats so intensely. Of course, there's still much to be done, and uh, rest assured that in the years to come, I'll give all the energy, all the strength of conviction I can to continue to face the unprecedented challenges that lie ahead, for sure. And I will see to it that uh, the group completes its impressive recovery that's the least I uh, could do in uh, response to your trust, uh, what I owe to Renner Group, which now has all the cards in its hands to be at the forefront of a fair and sustainable mobility industry. Ladies and gentlemen, dear shareholders, on behalf of the board, I would like to thank you once again. The AGM has come to an end. The uh, agenda is exhausted.